what God did in the Again, Lord, it's not about the numbers. But it's about each and every person that's coming in this evening, dear Lord. I pray the reason that we're coming, dear Lord, is to learn more about you. May our ears be open, but more importantly, our minds and hearts be open, dear Lord. May we get rid of all those other things that uh, clutter up inside our heart. And, uh, and we pray, dear Lord, that the darkest places of our hearts, dear Lord, may have light to be shined into them for the Holy Spirit to be able to take up residence. Dear Lord. So, Lord, tonight as we continue along our revival series, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be here amongst us and bless us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just to recap on last night, and for those people who are new here this evening, over the next four nights, we're going to be sharing, starting tonight, is what is truth. Last night we shared, who do you say I am? Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and the backdrop there was paganism. And in front of these temples, and in front of the cave that was called the gates to hell, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say I am? But then he asked, who do you say I am? Not because Jesus was suffering an identity crisis. Not at all. He knew who he was. He needed the disciples to know who he was. And then goes on in Matthew 16 and reads, From this moment forwards, Jesus began to tell him, to tell the disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. Jesus said, Upon you, upon this rock, the rock, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, that I will build my church. He was equipping them to establish his church upon them. So that was last night, what is truth? Sorry, last night was who you say I am. Tonight is what is truth. Trusting the authenticity and the credibility of the Word of God. As we look around, we know there are so many attacks on the Word of God. And not just from outside the churches. Week by week, people stand in pulpits and are rocking the people to sleep. And the people go, Amen, and they get feeling good. And they have no idea what is being said because they don't even open their Bibles. Ellen White says that we need to fortify our minds with the truth. We need to empty other things from our mind and put the Word of God in it. Because, you know, people one day, and I'm not the prophet of doom, not at all, but one day things are going to get a little bit worse for us and a bit hotter for us. Oh, and we... We may not have our Bibles with us. And oftentimes for a children's story, I'll say this. What goes into a rubbish bin? Trash. Trash. So when you open up the rubbish bin, what comes out? Trash. Trash. Ladies, if you have a trinket box, don't call it a jewelry box. I don't want to get in trouble with anyone here. But if you have a trinket box, what goes into that trinket box? Treasures. And when you open up that trinket box, what comes out? Treasure. Treasure. And if you put rubbish in your mind, only rubbish will come out of your mind. But if you put treasure in your mind, when the time comes for you to call on that, that's why it says fortify your mind with the Word of God. So tonight we are going to be talking about what is truth and the Word of God and how it's being distorted. And I want to encourage you to try and... Uh, to bring some of that confidence back into you for the Word of God because do you know today in this society and I look around I see a lot of young people and our young people not just the old people young people young people are troubled because they're very confused on what's going on out there and you know why they confuse sometimes people and I've said this so many times the wind falls on our shoulders first they are confused because sometimes the message we as adults give them and what they see they get confused so it's time for us to make sure that we do practice what we preach. So tonight is what is the truth. Tomorrow night, if you come back, and I'd like to see you come back, is why did Jesus have to die? Jesus had to die. When Jesus explained to his apostles, I'm going to Jerusalem. 
I'll be given up to the Gentiles. I'll be mocked. I'll be scourged. And then he says, I will be killed and raised the third day. Remember I said last night, Peter, all he heard was be killed. No, Jesus, that's not going to happen. He never heard be raised the third day. But Jesus needed to suffer on the cross and die for a punishment for our sins. Satan tempted him in the wilderness for a shortcut to world dominion. Fall on me, bow on me, and this will all be yours. And when Peter said to Jesus, and rebuked Jesus to say, no, this is not going to happen to you, that was the same thing. Satan was trying to encourage Jesus to take the crown, but not the cross. Jesus needed to take the cross for us. So tomorrow night we're going to be talking about finding sanctuary in the sanctuary. Many people do not understand the sanctuary service. Do you know, once you come to a clear knowledge of the sanctuary service, what it represents, right from the door to the most holy place, the penny will drop. But do you know the penny didn't drop for the Jews? Like I said again last night, the sanctuary service the sacrifice of the Lamb was for 1,500 years the central economy of the Jewish nation. And yet, they missed the Lamb. They missed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the reason I'm encouraging you and, and we're going through this night by night is so that we do not miss the second coming of Jesus. The Jews missed the first coming of Jesus. The religious ones. They're the ones who put him on the cross. They're the ones who scorned him and said, If you are the Son of God. So I encourage us for us not to miss the second coming of Christ. On night four, on Thursday night, we have amalgamated two sessions because we've cut this down from six to five. And on Thursday night we'll be sharing where did I come from, where am I now, and where am I going? And when will Jesus return? And how will we fit into that? Do you believe Jesus is coming? I'm not scaring you. Yes? Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. I'm not sure when. And I don't need to know where, but what I need to know is, I need to be ready for when the Lord breaks through the clouds and calls us home. So, on Thursday night, we're going to be sharing when will Jesus return. Talking about the first, the second, and I love to talk about the third coming of Jesus Christ. The third coming of Jesus Christ. And on the fifth night, the last night on the Friday evening, which I believe from this venue, we're going to be going to the Fijian Church in Acacia Ridge. Is that correct? Yes. On Friday night, we will share how do I stop, revive, and not just survive, but how will we thrive? Because that's what this whole session is called. Stop, revive, thrive. As I asked last night, Jesus asked a question. Of the man who was sick for 38 years. He said, do you want to be well? Do you want to be whole? And that's the question that you people need to answer. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? We're not going to be preaching about prosperity. You know, today, you know, there's big tele evangelists. Wouldn't it be good to have a plane? You know, I could land a plane on the field out there, I suppose, if I had one of these big planes. Um, but... Um, I think sometimes they pack up 40,000 people in these stadiums. And if you ever listen to what they preach, it's prosperity preaching. You know, you give and you'll get. And all will be well. It's like network marketing and all that sort of stuff. And that's not what Christianity is about. So on, the, on Friday night, we'll be talking about be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by what? The renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind. So without further ado, we will jump into tonight's uh, session. Let us pray. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you again, Lord, that you enable me to come in tonight to speak to your people. Lord, as we sit here, may we be reminded that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. May we be reminded that we are sons and daughters of God. And may we be reminded that we are princes and princesses of the King. Because many times we forget that, dear Lord. So tonight, Lord, as we come together, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to abide within us, to be with us. Lock out all the distractions, dear Lord. We know Satan's not happy with this sort of stuff. But I just pray right now for our minds to be settled and our hearts to be settled. For us to be able to take in what you're trying to tell us, Lord. Individually, as families, and corporately, Lord, as a church, we pray in the name of sweet dear Jesus. Amen. Amen. Signs. We see signs all around the place. How many people really heed the signs? When we see no standing, you normally see a car parked. It says no parking, and you'll normally see a car parked. If it says keep off the grass, what happens? People go on the grass. If it says wet paint on the chair, what happens? You see fingerprints all over, won't you? Because people want to see if it's wet. Up in the Northern Territory, they have signs that have a crocodile on them. And what does that mean? No swimming. There's a crocodile in there somewhere. Do you know how many people are taken by crocs in far north Queensland and the Northern Territory because they don't eat the signs? People take either little or no notice. And that is the same with the Word of God today. The Word of God is constantly being re-examined by people. Oh, you know, this needs re-examining. We need to go through it and, uh, and, and make it a little bit more um, relevant. Relevant to the time. Relevant to cultures relevant to geographical positioning on the earth. Talking about re-examining, redefining, reinterpreting the Bible. These people out there think that they are equipped and appointed to reinterpret the Bible. In light of what is relevant today, this is called progressive thinking. And I like to see that as people trying to work out the way they're going in their Christian life by licking their finger and feeling which way the wind is blowing. Doesn't the Bible talk about men being blown around by every wind of doctrine? And sadly, it is happening everywhere today. I've said this before and I've said it a million times because I think this is such a simple way of explaining truth and error. A broken clock can tell the time perfectly twice a day. And today, error is creeping in. And we are allowing it to creep in because people do not study their Bibles enough. It's not just a matter of reading. Last night we had a Bible study exploring. And we need to dig deep. Ellen White says, when you study the Bible, don't be content with the little bit of awe, you know, the little flickery stuff of gold that's on the top. She says, dig deep to where the good ore is. And that's what we need to spend time on. Truth and error. Black and white. But today there is grey. And you know when it comes to the word white, does anyone know how many shades of white there are on a white color code? There are up to 200 different shades of white. Now my brother, you've got a white shirt on, yes? And the lady behind you has got a white jump jacket on. I don't know if she uses Omo or what she uses, but her white's a lot brighter than your white. But what I'm saying is they're both white, aren't they? But when it comes to white, Sometimes people want to say a little white lie. Have you ever heard that? And you know what a disaster is when parents, when 
and the phone rings and the children go to answer the phone, the parents will say what? Tell them I'm not home. Please, I'm not trying to entertain you, but that's the truth, isn't it? You know what I tell my wife every time when the phone rings? Just tell them I'll call them back. That's the truth. I will call them back. For whatever reason, if sometimes truly when the phone rings, it's like a fire alarm going off in my head. And but I never tell it. And and people who work for me, ladies who've worked in an office for me before, I say very clearly, never ever lie for me. But you know what rolls off the tongues of parents to their children? Tell them I'm not home. Is that confusing to the kids? And then, when the kids lie to us, we want to smack them. And yet we tell them. We tell them we're not home. You know, today, Donald Trump. Please, we're not going to preach about Donald Trump. No, no, no. It's all right. Don't start throwing anything at me. But Donald Trump, you know, he's talking about fake news, yes? Everything is fake news to that man. Fake news, fake news, fake news. Isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? All the stuff that's coming out of it. And he's the president of a country for crying out loud. How did he get there? I don't know, but anyway, he's just being taped tonight. <laughs> Alright, but anyway, to the Americans who put him there, that's good luck to you. Anyway, but today, fake news. And people want to hear things about conspiracy, don't they? Love it. You know, and please, I'm not going to start about the 911 and the planes in there and the bombs going off. And I'm not going to start talking about that stuff tonight. But people lap that sort of stuff up. They love it. The conspiracy. The controversies. You know, Ellen White speaks really toughly about fanaticism. I've been bailed up after sermons by one particular guy who came out and wanted to tell me all about the body bags that were ready for me and so on. And I said, brother, you know, at the end of the day, it really don't face me how I'm going out of this world. But you know, I want to go out with Jesus Christ. You understand that? So body bags and barbed wires and all the other stuff we like to. But you know, then you've got... Oprah Winfrey. Anyone heard of Oprah Winfrey? Of course you have. The whole world's heard of Oprah Winfrey. Go home tonight. Actually, don't go and watch it because I'll tell you, but don't even watch it. Don't even waste your time. But Oprah Winfrey, she has an audience of millions. Great lady. She pays tithes. Whoa. Great lady. You know what she said in a panel one day with lots and lots of people? There are many ways to get to heaven and get to God, not just through Jesus Christ. And you know, people think, whoa, that's true, because Oprah Winfrey said so. That's Oprah Winfrey. Do you know, in our schools, if you get on to Insight, ABC program, and it was about four or five years ago, so this is very scary for parents who've got children, changing religious instructions for an ethics class. And this particular night, I'm sad I couldn't find it in my stuff to play it for you. But maybe one night before we finish, I'll play it for you. But they have an ethics class instead of religious instructions. And in this ethics class, nine-year-old and ten-year-old children are talking about what is true. And talking about things like this. What if grandma gave you something and you didn't like it? And what did you say to her you didn't like it? Or how do you say to you tell her the truth or not the truth? And then you know what all the kids, they all put in, and they walk away from that class saying, it's all right to tell grandma a lie in case she dies and has a heart attack because she's not happy with your answer. But this is the way that our schools, our children are being taught, that nine and ten year olds can start talking about no absolutes. And that is so sad that in this world today, there are no more absolutes. You know, there are many, many religions in the world. And before we start, I'm going to catch up to where I am here. And Sonny did show me how to use this. And I've broken it already. What am I supposed to point it out? Sorry, Sonny. Sonny, can you help? Please. I'm sorry. Oh. We shared this last night. And we left on this note last night. We have far more to fear from within than from without. True? It is. We have far more to fear from within than without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Stop there. Before anyone writes a letter to a conference. 
I said very clearly, who makes up the church? We make up the church. I take offense when people sit back and slingshot at the church. The church is this and the church is that. People, we are the church. And the rip falls on our shoulders first. We are the ones who need to uphold the truth. It says, Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honour by their consistent lives, by their godly example and their active influence, the cause which we represent. Doesn't one of the commandments say, do not take the name of Lord in vain? What do people see what you do from one Sabbath to the next? You know, on Sabbath it's so easy, isn't it? We play dress up, we come to church, we pretend we're happy to see everyone. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Happy Sabbath. But you know, deep inside, where are we? Really honestly. You know, I could fool the whole lot of you people on a Sabbath morning, but we can't fool the Lord. And it goes on and says, but how often have the professed advocates of truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement? So now I'm going to share you something which is two extremes. Two extremes. When it comes to... <coughs> and... Where have you been? Turn it on. Okay, turn it on. On the side. On the side, yes. Turn Green on. button. It must play the batteries are flat, maybe. And this is great. Don't you love it? Sorry, people, technology is not one of my fortes. Oh, thank you, my brother Paul. Oh, okay. All right. World religions. Do you know I looked up, and in world religions, there's anything between, some people say, five main religions. And then there's so many diversions from that. Some people talk about ten religions. How many diversions is that? Up to hundreds of religions. Up to hundreds of religions. Has anyone heard of Yeezyanity? Thank you and don't even look it up. Have you heard of that guy called Kane West, Kanye West or whatever his name is? His son sort of does all sorts of things and people talk after him. Do you know that his managers and his people, they start a new religion because they were getting away from Jesus because Jesus was carrying too much burden. And these guys started a new religion called Yeezyanity. Please don't look it up. Don't waste your time. But anyway, when it comes to all these different religions, and when it comes to Bibles, do you know how many Bible versions there are out there? Between Bible versions and translations? One conservative figure is there's about 20 different Bible versions, and that quickly gets to 63 and then between all the translations and versions, versions, there's 233 versions of the Bible, and it's translated into anywhere between 900 languages and 1440 languages. Do you think anything may have happened to the Bible with all these versions? I was driving along one day on my way to Roma to preach a sermon at Roma, and on came early in the morning an excerpt from what they call the Aussie Bushman's Bible. And you know, it was talking about the prodigal son coming home. Children, do not resort to violence. I won't say what went through my mind. I was about to, but I won't. And it's talking about, oh yeah, he saw his son, came up to him, grabbed a pair of thongs, and that sort of talk about the Bible. People have relegated the Bible to like a newspaper reading or a cartoon reading. Do you know how many people have died, how much blood has been spilt through the years for this Bible? And how do we handle this Bible? Like I said last night, people use the word, oh my God, so regularly. Which is, that is a disgrace for a Christian to say, oh my God, unless they are saying, oh my magnificent God. Oh my marvellous God. But instead of, oh my God, you know, for these bathroom renovations, you know, these renovated people, that's what you hear. It's a disgrace where people have relegated the word of God to. And as we said last night, that people tamper with uh, the name of Jesus and make lots of jokes. 
Do you know when anyone starts to tell me a Jesus joke? Thanks, buddy. I'm not interested. <laughs> no, I'm not interested. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Because it's not a joke. And the word of God is being tampered and tampered and tampered with. And it started with who? Where did the word of God being tampered with start? It started with Satan, didn't it? Remember? Satan in the garden. In Revelation, it gives three different names for Satan. It calls him serpent, devil, diablos, and Satan. And I put them down to dirty, rotten scoundrel. Because the word serpent, do you know where the base word of the word serpent comes from? If you pull that word serpent apart, it comes from the word whisper. And sadly, so many times when people have got something to say, it's generally maybe not right, they cut their hand and they whisper. And they go, I tell everyone if it's the truth. But that's the trademark of Satan. Didn't Jesus call Satan the father of lies? So the word serpent is cupping the hand and whispering, you know, that tss, tss, like the, the, the tongue of the, the snake. The word diabolos is accuser and slanderer. And Satan stands for the adversary, one who goes against. That's a pretty good, clear understanding of who Satan is, yes? Not Satan when you see at exhibition time. You know, people, uh, this is another thing. In exhibition time, when uh, you see these people running around these little horns on, and a little tail and a pitchfork. Hey, hasn't Satan sucked people in thee? And people believe that's what Satan is. So with the Word of God, there has been a distortion of the Word of God. Pulling things apart, taking out of context. You know, people talk about money is the root of all evil. Is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible say money is the root of all evil? Yes, it does, but it doesn't say that exactly. It says what? The love of money is the root of all evil. But you see, that's just a simple example. And do you know, people use the Bible as a hammer sometimes to smash the teeth out of the people with. I've seen it. I've seen it. And when it comes to us as Christians, when we set the bench mark for someone, where is it? It's up there. You know, for someone to jump over, it's very high. But for us, where do we set the benchmark? Low, so we just step over the top of it. Isn't that how we play with the Word of God? When the Word of God suits us to knock someone's head in with, we use it. People, is that the right way to use the Word of God? Not at all. Not at all. And we're going to share that in a second how people will use the Word of God. So, the dilution of the Gospel. People make God to be nothing but a big, fluffy teddy bear. You know, love you forever. No matter what you do. Isn't that right? You know, what is it? Once saved, always saved. Like a blank check, do whatever you like. That's not true, people. You know, Pastor Jeffrey Yulden said to me this. Arturo, whenever you have a captive audience, always share the balanced view. Tell the people about the love of God, but also let them know about the judgment. So it's not one without the other people. It's together. So there's been a dilution of the gospel. There's a relativity, an increasing desire to make the Bible more tasty, more palatable, easy to swallow. You know, in Isaiah was said, the people were saying to the, the, the uh, prophets are saying, speak to us smooth things. Tell us things that sort of make us feel good. That's not where it's about people. I need to speak in a way that when you go to sleep tonight, you can go to sleep comfortably knowing that if something happens to you tonight, and if you've given your heart to the Lord, you're going to end up in the right place. Amen? Amen. You know, I said to my wife when uh, we were coming to this uh, Macbeth Church, actually the old church at Macbeth Church, what used to happen is my son, we used to drop him to his grandmother's place after Sabbath school, and then I'd come back to church and the offering was coming around. And I always used to say to my wife, is this the first one or the second one? People, when it comes to the resurrection, when it comes to the resurrection, I pray that you wake up in the first resurrection, not in the second resurrection. 
Do you understand? I'm going to be covering that in another night's time. Postmodernism is a big thing today, you know, when it comes to the Bible. The Bible is being mishandled, minimized, eroded, and corrupted. Now, I want to share a couple of things. I'm going to give you a couple of extremes. We're talking about religions here. Does anyone know what that is? What, who that church belongs to? Okay, that's good. That is the West Boro Baptist Church in Kansas City in America. And the pastor that was there for a very long time was a guy called Fred Phelps. Now, Christian. Alright, so just stop there for a second. Right across the road. So see this? This is on a corner. Across the road this way, have a look what's built. Does anyone know what's built across the road? I, I did share this in a sermon I preached at Macrobat Church a long time ago. Hey! <laughs> Directly across the road, 50 feet away from the Westboro Church is this place. Now I'm going to tell you about this place where it all represents. And you know what this is, why I'm showing this to you? This is the two extremes of the Word of God. The two very, very extremes. And there's a reason I'm showing you this. Because today, people of the world is so mixed up. You know, there's a young fellow. I want you to pray for a young footballer. Mr. Isi Falau. I don't know him. But I'm telling you now, that man is standing up for what he believes. Amen. And he was asked a question. Where will people end up? And you know this tweet stuff? I don't do tweet or Facebook or anything of that stuff. I don't know if you guys do, but anyway, that's what you do. But I've got no time for that stuff. But anyway, he done some tweet. And he answered just from the Bible. And he's in a lot of trouble at the moment. But it wasn't his words. He was just talking from the Bible. And he's in a lot of hot water at the moment. So please pray for that guy. Because he's sticking up for what he believes in. He's sticking up for what he believes in. So, let me go back. Mr. Fred Phelps. The problem is that Fred Phelps glorified in sin. And I'm going to share this with you because this is the two extremes of the Word of God. And we need to understand that people, our young people need not be confused. So, this guy here, he gloried in sin and his denunciation of sin at the expense of the gospel. The good news of the gospel simply never came through when that man opened his mouth. Do you know if you go onto his website, and this is a Christian man, go onto his website, and on his website is a counter. And you know what that counter says? That since you have logged onto this website, so many people of God are sent to hell. Man, is this guy... This guy is not doing the right thing for Christianity. And my warning and caution to each and every one of you people is may the people see the real Jesus in you. May the people hear the real Jesus in you. Not this fanaticism type of stuff. Let me keep going. Is this boring anyone? No? Can I keep going? Good. The grace and mercy of God in Christ were never made clear and destroyed God's message. And a representative of the gospel. Remember Saul? Saul, Saul who became Paul. He was on the way to Damascus, you know, on his high horse. What was he going to go to Damascus? To put a party up for the Christians? Yes. To persecute them. But he thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was full of zeal and passion. But he was on the wrong road. And you know what had to happen to him? He had to get knocked off his high horse. And that's what I've said many times, people, as Christian people. We need to learn many things, but we need to unlearn many things as well. Let me keep going. Fred Phelps claimed to preach about all sorts of things anyway. And you know, he's the guy that used to stand at the funeral. You know, he used to get protesters around at funeral services of the soldiers. Now, please stop now. I'm not talking about war and I'm not, you know, saying it's good to go to war. Don't, don't hear me saying that. You know, there was so much within the church um, antagonism over that movie. What was that movie that just came out a little while ago? I was talking about it. 
the test of Dawson, what is that called? Sorry. What was it? Hacksaw Ridge, that's it, sorry. You speak in Fiji and I couldn't hear. Hacksaw Ridge, Hacksaw Ridge. You know, and there were so many people who were against it, saying, oh, you shouldn't watch it because it's encouraging the war. No, 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 no. You know, I reckon every young person should see the documentary of Death and Dos. Not the movie. The movie's too graphic. Yeah. Shocking. But you need to see the documentary, which is called the Objectional... Something like that. What is it called? Oh, what is it? Conscientious Objector. I was trying to remember. Conscientious. Who's seen the Conscientious Objector? How many people have seen it? Really? People. One night we're going to have a movie night here. We're going to see the Conscientious Objector. It's people who were with that man in the army. It's not all the Hollywood stuff. It's real people. To tell you what a real Christian is like. A man that while well, he's praying gets hit in the back with his with boots. You know, all the men thought it was funny. And in the morning, what happened? The men woke up and those boots were polished beside their hands. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. You need to see that. Let's see it together. I get excited. I love that movie. But anyway, let's keep going on. The, the gospel that this fellow was preaching was really, really, really mixed up. He not only preached using the most vile and offensive graphic language, but he also took the next step and organized those protests that I was talking about. Now, let's go to this one. 50 feet across the road, we've got the other extreme. You know where almost anything goes. And that's what some people are like when it comes to Christianity. You can do anything you like, brother. You'll be safe because guess what? God loves you, mate. It's okay. God loves you. And just come as you are. But you know what they miss? Come as you are, but you need to be changed. When you come into contact with the Lord, you've got to be changed. The lady that had the infirmity of the blood for 12 years, she just touched the hem of Jesus and she was changed because she touched it in faith. So this thing is called the Equality House, a symbol of compassion, peace, and positive change. Have we heard that word tolerance? Yeah, we've heard that tolerance word? Of course you have. You know, I think there is an unhealthy tolerance of the word tolerance. Because that word tolerance is not in the Bible. The Equality House is a symbol of compassion, peace, and positive change. Why am I telling you this, people? This is two extremes of Christianity. She lives. The house which is painted the colours of the pride flag serve as a resource centre for all who are planting peace and human rights and bullying prevention. I mean, there's some good things there. You know, initiatives and stands as a visual reminder of our commitment as global citizens to equality or to all. People, I'm not going to go keep going on about this tonight. Let's come back to the serious stuff, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. We are blessed that the Word of God endures forever. Correct? That's 1 Peter 1.25. The Word of God endures forever. He has preserved the Word of God. Has anyone ever heard of the Waldensians? Waldensians? Do you understand how those people preserved the Word of God? You know, it was inside their coats. Little bits and pieces and writing it out and sharing it out there. As they were going out being merchants and selling things. And they were passing on the word of God. And the word of God has stayed alive. Do you know the printing press only came in around the 1450, something like that. But the word of God has prevailed long before 1450. And when the printing press came out, hallelujah, amen, that was a great thing. But then, you know, there's so many other printing presses that have done so many conversions and just gets mixed up. But anyway, in the word of God, we see the body of truth. That was handed down to the church of God. And that body of truth must be held on to people. We must guard it passionately. We must guard the word of God. We must defend it. And when it comes to preaching, we need to preach nothing but the straight word of God. Rightly divided. We must watch out for those who claim extra biblical revelation. We don't need to look for a new truth, a new revelation, or something that may have been missed. 
We don't need to seek after the latest fad, methodology, or philosophy. Rather, we need to look intensely into the Word of God. How many people own a concordance here? Okay, two, three concordances in the house. If you want to study the Word of God, we need to put it back into context. And we need to get ourselves a good concordance. That's the way to study the Word of God. To understand what that word meant back then. So we need to look intensely into the Bible. And evaluate everything with the light of the truth given to us. Have you ever heard that word sincere? Peter talks about looking for that sincere Word of God. I'm going to cover that in a second towards the end of my service. Never in history has doubt and confusion over the Bible existed as much as today. And nothing has flamed the fire of confusion and doubt over the Bible than all those translations. Something from the Time magazine, I was trying to get the photo but I couldn't, but from the Time magazine, April 20, 1981. Lady Diane was on the front that night, that day, or whatever that, for that magazine. But in that magazine, Time had written this, unprecedented confusion of the choices in Bible. And it says, never have so many major translations hit the market. Since 1880, over 200 different translations have appeared. Every six months, a new English version of the Bible. People, I'm not going to tell you now tonight. I studied for the King James. Oh, hang on a second. Someone say, oh, no. And I'm not going to get into that argument with anyone. I'm really not. If anyone wants to come and talk to me privately about it, I won't have to talk to anyone about it. But I stick with the King James Version. That's me. I cut my teeth on the new King James Version. That's what I cut my teeth on. And then I went to the King James Version. Because just to put my mind into that mode. Now please, I'm not saying anything, whatever translation you have. But please, there are some good translations. And trust me, there are some not very, very good translations out there. Preachers by the thousands will stand in a pulpit weekly. And you know what they do? They correct the King James Bible. I've heard people correcting the King James Bible. And they, they talk about the King James sometimes as an unfortunate translation. Now again, like I said, I'm not going to, you know, because I've got the, the light down here, I'm not going to push that down your throat. But that's what I read anyway. My question is, where is the Lord in regard to all these different things that need to happen to the Bible? Redefining, reamplifying the Bible, and so on. Isn't God the one who spoke the worlds into existence? Isn't this a transcript of the Word of God brought down to men through the Holy Spirit? And people want to straighten out the Word of God. The Christian gospel is not to be proclaimed from a position of moral superiority or smugness, but rather from the experience of one who has come to know the grace of God and cannot wait to share that message. Here's a question for you. Who wants justice? Come on. In your humanness, I know no one wants to put hands up, but who likes to see justice? Of course we do. Yeah, we want to see justice, don't we? But when the Lord breaks through the clouds, tell me, you want to see justice or you want to see mercy? All of a sudden, left out the window with the justice. Let's stick with the mercy part, Lord. Let's stick with the mercy part. When we speak of God's grace, that's what happens many times. People miss the grace of God. We miss the grace of God. You know, the Jewish were into their robotic type of ritual keeping. Into their mechanical way of worshipping God. And they missed the point. I pray that as you people come to church and you come together as a body of believers, may you come united under the grace of God. Under the grace of God. I'm going to go into the Bible in a second and I just want to. What's he has the time? Yeah, look at this. The Bible is a rock of diamonds. And these are a few little snippets that I've picked up. A rock of diamonds, a chain of pearls, the sword of the Spirit. 
a chart by which the Christian sails to eternity, the map by which he daily walks. You know, Romans, Romans has been called the map book for the Christian. It's a, it's a directory. You know what you call a directory? It says, it is the sundial by which we set our daily life in the balance by which our actions are weighed. The, the Bible contains the mind of God. Correct? It contains the state of man. It contains the way of life, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. You know, Judgment Day will be a sweet and sour day. It will be a sweet and sour day. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. It gives light to you to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. A Baptist theologian wrote this, and I love this, and that's why I've kept it. A thousand times over, the death knell of the Bible has been sounded. The funeral procession has been formed. The inscription cut on the tombstone and the committal read. But somehow the corpse never stays put. No other book has been so chopped up, knifed, sifted, scrutinized and vilified. And just stop there for one second. I was going to bring you, has anyone ever heard of the uh, Thomas Jefferson Bible? Ah, oh, I meant to put it on here for you to see this. Thomas Jefferson Bible. You know, he was the third president of America. You know what he did? He got two New Testaments together. And with a razor blade and a pair of scissors and some glue, he put together what he thought was the right way to present the Bible. And do you know what he did? He took out of the Bible every reference to the divinity of Jesus Christ. He took out everywhere where it said Son of God. He took out the resurrection. And you know what? how he ended the Bible? Was Jesus died they laid him in the tomb and they departed. And that's the end. That's the Thomas Jefferson Bible. So you know where it says, there's nothing, no book ever been so chopped up. What a book on philosophy or religion has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible, with such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition. Upon every chapter, line and tenet, the Bible is still loved by millions, Read by millions and studied by millions. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen to that. At one time, does anyone know where Zanzibar is? The island of Zanzibar? Just off the uh, eastern coast of Africa from Tanzania. At one time on the island of Zanzibar, just off the coast of Tanzania, the Indian Ocean, 30,000 people were sold as slaves every year. Sydney Collett in All About the Bible says, that the English cathedral in Zanzibar is built on the site of the old slave market. And the communion table stands on the very spot where the whipping post once stood. Amen? Amen? The world abounds with such instances. As one has truly said, we might as well put our shoulder to the burning wheel of the sun and try and stop it on its flaming course as attempt to stop the circulation of the body. Yes? Isn't that beautiful? In the 1700s, when he was just 17 years old, Voltaire, we've heard of Voltaire, who later became a famous French philosopher, stood in a crowded auditorium and said of Christ's first disciples, it took 12 ignorant fishermen to build Christianity. But he said, I will show you that one Frenchman can destroy it. He spent a lifetime trying to do that, to destroy it. He once stated that a hundred years from his day, the Bible would have passed into the mists of history as people became more liberated and enlightened. Yet today, Voltaire is dead. The Bible is still loved and read and studied and lived by millions of people. And only 50 years after Voltaire died, the Geneva Bible Society used his house and his printing press 
to produce stacks and stacks of Bibles. And I heard that one out there. Man, I get excited by this sort of stuff. Don't you get excited by it? And please, I'm not talking about excitement where people, you know, I'm talking about deep excitement with this. Because the Word of God will never pass. The grass will pass. The trees will pass. But the Word of God will never pass. Amen. The Bible was written over 1,500 years by more than 40 different authors from different walks of life and over 40 generations. Moses, a political leader. Amos, a herdsman. Solomon, a king. Luke, a physician. Matthew, a tax collector. Peter, a fisherman. It was written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written in different places. Moses in the wilderness, Daniel in the palace, Jeremiah in the dungeon, Paul in the Roman prison, Luke while he was travelling. It was written at different times. David wrote it in times of war, Solomon in times of peace. It was written in different moods. Some authors wrote from the heights of joy and others in the depths of sorrow. Let me say something. When the people who are trained out there in our armies, and I just looked at my dear sister then, I, I thought of her husband, a, a capitano in the fire um, brigade. When they do their training, when do they do their training? In a peace talk, you know, generally, they do it in a peace talk. Do you know there are armies in the world that teach their soldiers how to pull their weapons apart in the dark because when they need to do whatever they do is it in times of peace or in times of trouble in times of trouble so what I'm trying to encourage you is people in times of peace now we should be knowing how to use our Bible read our Bible study our Bible so that when the time comes we can be able to contribute something in an intelligent and sane way as a Christian. Let's keep going. Dennis Prager is a nationally syndicated radio talk show host. I love this. Columnist and author. In a debate with Oxford atheist philosopher Jonathan Glover, Prager asked a question. If you, Professor, were stranded at the midnight hour in a desolate Los Angeles street, and if you stepped out of your car with fear and trembling, and you were suddenly hearing the weight of pounding footsteps behind you, like some of these big Fijian boys, and you saw ten big, like the Fijian men, who had just stepped out of the dwelling coming towards you, would it that you, sorry, would it or would it not make a difference if you knew they were coming from a Bible study? Hey? Wouldn't you rather they be coming from a Bible study than coming from somewhere else, people? Let's go into Bibles. Has anyone got Bibles here tonight? Does anyone need Bibles? We're going to close off very quickly. We're going to go to Acts 17. Acts 17. In our Bibles, Acts 17. I've got a few more slides to share, but let's, let's go in our Bibles to Acts 17. And I'm just going to very, very quickly go through this. Acts 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts 17. Acts 17. We have Paul at Thessalonica. Then we have Paul at Berea. At Paul at Berea, on verse 10, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Solus by night down to Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Let's stop there for a second and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm going to do a little bit more to share. I just pray to you, God, that above the distractions, your voice can be heard, dear Lord. I pray to you, God, at this point in time again, for your Holy Spirit's big commission to be amongst us, dear Lord, to settle us so that we can take in what you're trying to tell us. Pray that Jesus. Amen. So, Paul's come to Berea. Verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all what? Readiness, it says, of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. You know, so many people get sucked in from a pulpit every week because they don't read from their Bibles. You know, if you went to the beach, what would you take to the beach? Towel, sunscreen. You'd paint. take a towel, wouldn't you? I hope you'd take some sort of clothes. You'd take your costume, you'd take your clothes, you'd take your hat, you'd take your sunscreen, you'd take your umbrella. But do you know how many people come to church without a Bible? They come to church without a Bible. 
What happened if the power went flat? Dun dun. All over. Let's go. Let's come back next week when electricity comes back on. We go to the beaches with our umbrellas and our sunscreen, but yet we don't go to churches with our Bibles. Paul's talking about those in Berea that they search the word diligently. And then he goes to Athens. And when he comes to Athens, and I'm just going to really, really go quickly through this, he comes to Athens, and you know what he finds at Athens? He says, There were certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and they said, What is this Babylon saying? He's preaching unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him into the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is? Keep reading on. And it says that these people, it says, for all the Athenians and the strangers which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's Acts 16, verse, sorry, Acts 17, verse 20. You know how many times people just want to hear some new thing and they just get so itchy about it. And it happens in our churches, people. I get it all the time. You know what I heard um, about a year ago? And it started to spread through a couple of churches. And I know this firsthand because I had to rectify it. Some people were in a little bit of a study group. And they got together. And from there, it started to go like wildfire. Because somebody came up to my wife on the very next Sabbath and said, Oh, Leslie, did you hear that the Pope is making his new set of Ten Commandments on some stones of marble? And I said, What? And people were believing this. And do you know what I did? I went home and I went, uh, I said, hang on a second, something doesn't sound right here. And do you know I went home to check it up? And it is one of these hoaxes. You know, has anyone ever heard of onion spam? <coughs> what happens is they rip everything off. And people see something and go, oh, that's so true. The Pope, the Pope's making the new commandments. And they get all excited about it. Do we not believe that God is in control, people? God was in control in the Babylonian time. God was in control in the Greek time. And the Medes and the Persians. God was in control in the Roman time. And God is in control now. But things do spread like wildfire because people love to hear. You know, the Bible talks about each ears. People love to hear each, you know, all the each ears. What's that? Tell me a little bit more. You know, that's why these books, you know, like the Woman's Weekly, they sell like wildfire. Because people love to read a little bit about, oh, what's going on with this one? What's happening here and so on? Man, man, man. But anyway, Paul Athens, Jude, Timothy. I'm going to go to Samuel in my mind. I'm going to tell you about this. You can't. Do you know when um, the um, Israelites went out to war and the Philistines beat them? You'll find this in 1 Samuel. And the Philistines took the ark. The Ark of the Covenant. And they stole the Ark from the war. They took the war. They, because, because you know what happened was this. The people went out to war. I wish I had time to go through this with you. But it says that when they went into war, the Israelites got their... They got beaten. It's going to be but they got beaten. And they got beaten fair and square. So you know what happened? They went back and they got the Ark of the Covenant. And let's take, take that into the middle of the war. Because you know what they did? They treated the Ark of the Covenant like a rabbit's foot. You know, like a lucky charm. And it says in the Bible, there was lots of noise going on. And you know what happened? They were slain. Because there was lots and lots of noise, but God wasn't there. Oh, I'd love to share that. It's a sermon itself. It's a sermon itself. And then what happened was the Philistines took the ark. Now the ark traveled around to seven different cities. And it came to a place... I can't remember the name of the place, but there was a temple of Dagon there. And there was a statue. And in the morning, the statue was down, broken on its face. And they thought, oh, what's going on here? And they put it back up the next morning, down on its face again. And then you know what the Philistines did? They went, hang on a second. This thing here, this ark, everywhere it's gone through, all different places, people got boils and places and all sorts of things and sicknesses. And, and so they worked there and they said, hang on a second. This ark is trouble to us. So you know what they did? They sent the ark back. And it says in 1 Samuel chapter 6 that the Philistines made a new cart. 
And they put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, the new cart. It's very, very important you understand this. And then they sent it back to the people of God. And you know how they sent it back? They sent it back with two milking cows. And they took the baby cows away from the mother cows. And they said, hey, if these milking cows know their way back, they know it's from God. Because the milking cows hear the little baby cow, you know, making whatever noise they make. And you think that the mother cow wants to stay there. But no, the mother cows, two mother cows on a new ark, on a new, sorry, a new car, they took the ark of the covenant back to the people. Now something happened. The people actually looked inside and they were slain. Do you know the Philistines never ever opened up? Ellen White says the Philistines never even opened up the ark because they knew it was the ark of God. And if they thought that might bring them some special powers, but it didn't. So they sent it back and they returned to send them. But then you know what happened in 2 Samuel 6? Exactly. It says that David ordained the ark to be moved in a new cart. You know, the ark was only to be moved by the men who were ordained to move it. There was some very strict rules how the Ark of the Covenant should be moved on poles with certain rings on the shoulders of the Levites. But David put the Ark onto a new cart, it says. And what happened? The bullet went a little bit like this. The Ark of the Covenant started to move. And what happened? What happened to Uzzah? Uzzah touched it, and what happened? He died on the spot. Now listen, I've got my take on will Uzzah be in heaven? Because Uzzah's motives were correct. He saw the Ark of the Covenant stumbling, and he tried to protect it. But God was pointing out that his law is so strict that no one was to touch it. So that's that's another story in itself. But the new way. A lot of people are looking for new ways to deliver the Bible. New ways. And my encouragement is, don't look for a new way. Because going on from that word, a new way, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, look for the sincere word of God like a newborn baby looking for the milk. You understand? Look for the sincere word. And you know where that word sincere comes from? It's a Greek word, sine sera. Two words. Without wax. The merchants who used to make all the marble back then, they were smart. You know what they used to do? You know marble has veins going through it. But if the marble was deformed or cracked, you know what they'd get? Some wax. And they rub the marble up with wax. And some sucker had come and buy it, and until he put it in the sun, hey, it was all right. And also, the people who used to have the honey, what they would do is this. They would strain the honey, and keep straining the honey, and keep straining the honey, so that when they put the honey up to the light, and they could see the light of the sun through it, and there was no wax in it, then they knew it was pure. You know, people talk about 100% pure, 100% pure. I don't know what some of the things that we drink sometimes when they say 100% pure. But we need the 100% pure Word of God. The Word of God tells us very clearly in Isaiah 28, 10, line upon line, precept upon precept. I'm going to finish with this, Jeremiah 6, 16. Can we go now, Bible to Jeremiah 6, 16? And because this is all about a journey, we are on a journey, people. Stop, revive, survive. Those people who weren't here last night, we were talking about this. We are travellers on a road. And if anyone's driven on that road out there, they'll see signs that say, Stop, revive, survive. And we need to heed that warning. Because some people don't even know they're getting tired. Some people don't even know they're getting weary until it's too late. And the same thing with us as Christians, on our pilgrimage from earth to heaven, we need to stop, revive, and not just survive, but thrive. And I want to just go to Jeremiah 6.16. Jeremiah 6, 
Jeremiah 6, 16 says this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the what? The old parts where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. You shall find rest for your souls. Be not the Sadducees. The rest of the verse says, what they say it says, but they said, we will not walk in the way. The intention of this passage is to create the image of a traveller who has become lost along the way. The traveller is advised to stop where he is, collect his bearings, inquire which is the correct way on which he had once been but has since wandered, and then continue on his journey along the correct path. The passage ended with, we will not walk therein. During Jeremiah's 40 years of ministry, he repeatedly pleaded with the people to hearken the word of God. But they ignored him. And do you know so many people ignore the word of God today? Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you again for the opportunity of, of sharing your word with you. Lord, I know I had so much else to share. But Lord, uh, I trust in you that uh, I share what you want to be shared with you. So Lord, I just pray to you, God, that uh, the people will take something away from this tonight, Lord. And may they apply it to their lives, dear Lord. Because the whole purpose of this is to make us fit for the kingdom. So dear Lord, please enter into us. I pray, dear God, that the Holy Spirit has got ample place to work in our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.